Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for, uh, everyone, for coming along. Um, today's session here uh, I'm presenting is debunking the myths of digital governance. Um, I'm Morgan Richings. I'm a senior program manager at Acquia. Uh, just a bit of an introduction uh, and welcome as we run through the agenda. Uh, so today I'll be covering off uh, what is digital governance? Um, is digital governance actually needed? A uh, case study of who needs digital governance and what digital governance can actually do for you. So a lot about digital governance. Uh, before we get to that, uh, a little bit, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Morgan Richings, as mentioned. Um, I have 15 years working on uh, different digital focused roles. Currently, I work for Acquia. Uh, my role as a senior program manager is a mix of many different things. I think like everyone's roles these days, uh, a bit of project management, a business analyst, uh, and also account manager to my clients. So where do I come from? I come from Canberra, Australia. Uh, please don't laugh, um, though I think uh, a few of my friends in, uh, in Hobart probably get the same um, st stick that uh, everyone else does, uh, everyone else gives uh, from around the world. So um, Canberra itself is known for the uh, balloon spectacular. Uh, once a year for about a week, balloons are going, no, actually it's known for Parliament House and the politicians that are there. So I'd like to think the balloon spectacular actually does uh, take that focus, but uh, here we are. So what motivates me? Um, my family, of course. My, um, this is a picture of us um, up at uh, Lake Gindavine, um, just a few hours up from Canberra. Besides that, uh, what motivates me at work? Um, I am passionate about the change management processes behind best practice web content management system implementations. I am weird like that. Um, there's plenty of devs out there, uh, out there outside uh, today that'll talk about different technologies and things like that. I love process. Who here loves process? Hands up. Yes, yes, my friends, my friends. Uh, the other thing I like is uh, building better collaborative partnerships within teams. So as a vendor working with our clients, um, the motivation I have is to actually achieve the most valuable outputs uh, with the resources that we collectively have available. We walk in the door with a budget, a timeline, a set of scope that needs to be achieved. So how can we actually deliver upon that and deliver upon that as much as we can? Um, and one thing I like to talk about is going beyond uh, on time, on budget as expected. Um, so if we can get to that point of going beyond that, we can actually get to the really cool stuff which everyone wants to work on besides uh, potentially just the very boring state things that project might be, uh, actually project goals that might be there in the first place. Why am I talking about all these things? Um, because good digital governance helps to deliver uh, those goals and ideas I've talked about above. So what actually is digital governance? Let's start with, before we throw the buzzword of digital into it, let's talk about governance. So governance is a decision-making framework which defines the people, the processes, and the technologies used to support your organization. Um, so we all have jobs, we all have things to do, um, and we have the technologies that ultimately deliver upon those goals that we try to achieve. So digital governance uh, is a critical framework and process for managing a successful digital presence. So your organization's digital presence, whether that's a kiosk, whether that's an intranet, whether that's a website or multiple websites or uh, AR or um, potentially um, Google Assistant or whatever the hell that, that thing actually is, um, it's more than just writing good code. Good code is really, really helpful. Uh, it's really, really important. Um, but there's more to it than just that. Um, so a well-designed digital governance framework will minimize the number of ongoing technical debates required for managing your organization's digital presence. So part of this is why have a digital governance plan? You want to be in a situation where good code can be delivered, good efficiency can be, can be gained, and there are some things that if you actually set a plan in place in the first place, you can avoid dealing with those issues um, and debates and discussions um, as you go throughout the, the actual delivery of your project or ongoing business as usual. So we're here to debunk the myths of digital governance. Uh, and the first question I'll pose to everyone here, uh, is this a truth or a myth? Uh, I've completed a rock solid governance plan document. Uh, it'll address all my digital governance issues. So hands up who thinks this is a myth. Hands up who thinks this is a truth. Come on, someone, anyone. All right, fine, so Jeremy, why would you think it's a myth? Yeah. Yeah. 
So with that in mind, your work is never done. Um, you know, your plan's a great start. Um, communicating that plan, seeking further information, further feedback, uh, actually improving the effectiveness and actually testing that plan throughout the life of your project is an important, essential thing to do. So yes, definitely a myth. Um, and the point here is that it is ultimately a simple plan to start off with. So everyone can uh, tick off the scorecard. You've, you've got one for one so far. So once again, what is digital governance? Uh, it makes clear who has decision-making authority in these areas. Um, digital strategy, um, what's your organization's approach to using the internet and the World Wide Web? Why are we here? What are they intending to do? Uh, your digital policy, what your organization must and must not do online. Um, ultimately, there are guidelines that guide what we do. Uh, we can't just do whatever the hell we want to, and having some form of policy or plan in the first place will help provide that guidance. Um, and digital standards, uh, what is the nature of your organization's digital portfolio? So think DTA and other organizations like that providing those standards for you, but also what is it about your organization that is actually unique? So digital governance is most effective in larger, more distributed organizations. So if you are one person and you look after everything, setting out a plan, a digital governance plan for you and yourself and how you guide your own self is probably less effective. But when we're talking about organizations that are multiple cities, multiple time zones, multiple languages, multiple everything, um, different cultures across, across the world. This is where having those digital governance plans actually will help assist and guide you and how you work uh, within your organization and the work that you do. Um, so it's most effective in being able to actually sign ownership and confirm delegation. Um, the priorities of why you're here and what you're doing. Um, and defining the guideline stands and, as well as training resources to, to deliver upon that vision. Um, so some components now, I have to admit, these are actually only three of about probably 18 I could rattle off. Um, but we'll focus here on content editorial workflow, um, uh, digital governance, branding and visual assets, and uh, technical governance as we go through. This is definitely not a definitive list, um, and I'm sure you can think of some yourselves. Um, but we only have limited time uh, for the session as it is. So content and editorial governance. Um, so content governance establishes standards for how your organization communicates with its audience in an engaging and persuasive manner across channels. So as I said before, um, you might have kiosks, you might have a website, a web app, a progressive web app, a name all your different omni-channel uh, opportunities. Um, and each of, those, um, each of those will have their own content editorial guidelines associated, hence having a plan to actually guide, guide that. Brand governance ensures consistency across your brand promise of your organization. Um, consistency is critical um, as it drives awareness, engagement, retention, and loyalty for your customers. So technical governance. Um, now, I have to concede that this um, presentation actually uh, worked with two of my colleagues from uh, Europe, Graham and Werner. Um, I've stolen some of his technical slides and cut those down. Um, so please don't uh, come after this presentation and ask me more details about code governance, security governance, domain and platform governance, because I only have a very uh, satellite view of that. But here we are again, truth or myth. A good digital plan is a strict set of standards or design rules to enforce coworkers and distributed teams in doing exactly what you want. Who thinks this is the truth? Hands up. Uh, who thinks this is a myth? Who doesn't know? Come on, Jeremy. <laughs> um, so why, Chris, would you think this is a myth? So definitely a myth, um, and it's kind of the big stick authority view. Um, so this approach, if you do run with it, um, treats individuals as risk factors. The people that you've employed do jobs and do jobs well, you're actually treating them as a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, looking to suppress unwanted behavior, um, and that's going against the idea of actually building um, a supportive environment that actually trusts the people that you've employed, ideally vetted, um, and there's a reason why they're here. And ideally, you're actually empowering your team so they can focus on delivering. So once again, a digital governance plan can help support this approach. Um, so autonomy, not authority. Um, so it doesn't have to be viewed as an enforcement of authority over developers and contributors. Um, good governance enables autonomy um, to find the best um, and most elegant solutions using the most appropriate tools. Um, but I guess the key thing here is that um, people need to actually know what the standards are to be able to comply with them. Um, it's not to say that you can't 
um, have, uh, I guess, healthy debates um, about how to approach things and, and potentially contrary to the guidelines itself, um, but set up an environment where you're actually debating the issues as opposed to individuals or um, coming from a situation of your own personal kind of biases and things like that. So is digital, is digital governance needed? Um, hands up who thinks digital governance is not needed? Um, who thinks it is actually needed? Cool. Hopefully, uh, well actually I think it's pretty, pretty much consensus. So if you do see something here that you don't necessarily agree with, I'm actually uh, keen to hear your thoughts as we go through. We'll have a Q&A towards the end of the, uh, the presentation anyway, so feel free to take some notes and uh, go from there. So. Truth or myth, digital governance is easy. I'll look up digital governance frameworks on Wikipedia, copy paste, and my job is done. Uh, who doesn't think this is a myth? <laughs> Very good, one dissenting view. Um, I think maybe at this point in time, you've kind of got the, um, the answer to these things. It is another myth that it's easy. Um, so the key thing about this myth is that um, you can look at frameworks. You can look at um, out-of-the-box kind of, and you can buy out-of-the-box frameworks and governance plans and things like that. The key thing here, though, is that um, every organization is different, um, genuinely different. The people that make that up, the processes, the goals, et cetera, they are different. Um, the culture of your organization will actually influence um, those behaviors and how successful um, a pre-existing digital governance plan could be. Um, but the key thing about this is that what you bring to your organization um, is, sorry, what you bring to a governance plan is your understanding of your organization and how it works. So I guess the general advice is if you do go or you have somebody who comes along and says, we've got a digital governance plan for you, unless they work for your organization, unless they've lived and breathed that experience, um, it's only effectively a guide um, as to what you should achieve. So once again, one of the earlier myths talking about testing and validating um, those guidelines that you have in place, this is kind of reinforcing that as well. Um, your organization is unique. Um, as much as it could be very similar to other places you've worked, to, uh, worked with before. Uh, so do we need digital governance? Everyone in the audience is saying yes, um, and I agree. Um, so the, in the end, um, most organizations are facing challenges around budget, times, resourcing, availability, all of those good things that we all deal with on a daily basis. And that limited pool of resources are needed to actually support those priorities. So where do we start? Um, what are the goals? What are, how are we effectively agreeing to deliver upon these things when we all have um, those situations where there's enough people, time, et cetera. Um, and these guidelines can actually help um, provide um, that guidance in how these things can be achieved. So a clear plan for your enterprise and your organization. Um, and at the same time, um, a solid digital governance framework enables organizations to manage and mitigate those challenges successfully. So these are some typical digital governance challenges that we've um, identified, and I guess uh, our organization deals with on a fairly regular basis, um, broken down by organizational delivery and brand challenges. Um, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to read through those. One, two, three, four, eight, and 10. Um, of those described up there, who would have only hit maybe one or two of those? Hands up. All right, let's go three or f only about three or four of these issues. Uh, let's jump a little bit, little bit higher. Maybe who's probably hit around about 80% of those issues in your organization, or 100% of those issues, and I think everyone's got their hands up as it is. Um, so these, these are challenges which everyone has to deal with, um, and I guess that's where I talked about every organization is unique. These challenges in themselves are not unique. Um, if they're not unique, if they're understood, if people are dealing with these, then ideally there, are some form of, uh, there is some form of governance or way to actually manage these things on an ongoing basis. If you identify the problem, you can discuss it, you can try and identify it, you can try and find ways to change that um, within your organization or even within your team um, as an opportunity. So, talked about the challenges, but some of the digital governance objectives that we're trying to achieve. So, uh, establish clear roles and responsibility, uh, definition of purpose, um, of digital presence. Um, what is that minimum viable product you're trying to achieve? What is the goal that you're trying to go for, the desired capabilities? Uh, determining where flexibility is necessary and where it should be removed. So, giving people the opportunity to do things, but at the same time, flexibility itself and customization can become a problem. Um, enabling shared ownership and coordination. Uh, enabling efficient uh, evaluation of priorities and, con and continually connect execution, strategy, vision, and goals. 
Two I want to pull out, though, here is these. Uh, establishing clear roles and responsibilities, enabling shared ownership and coordination. Um, can you both establish clear roles and responsibility if it's a shared ownership of that? Can you? That's a question I guess I'm putting out to the audience here. Who, who actually um, uh, believes that you can have both um, a shared responsibility but clear roles and responsibilities? Cool. Um, and I'll pick on Jeremy again. How, uh, how, how, do you, how would you achieve that um, in that sense? I mean, do you see the challenge I guess I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to in, in that? So I guess responsibility is a sign, but at the same time, there's a shared kind of ownership and delivery, a team-based approach to actually uh, achieve that. Is it kind of? Yeah, maybe responsibility might be a team. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I, I struggle with this, one with, with this one myself. So it's something that I, I, I naturally gravitate towards. Um, who's responsible for this? Is it Jeremy? Is it who is that person? Um, but ultimately, um, you know, it's not a group of individuals. It, it ultimately is a team. Um, in itself, and so there needs to be that support and the, and that, the governance around that. Um, and so it's something I, I struggle with myself um, on a regular basis, um, but just wanted to call that one out as we, as we went through. Um, so once again, digital framework outputs, things that um, you were actually producing as part of a digital governance plan. Um, a charter, defining customer experiences, goals, and how the platform supports those goals. Uh, establishing the governance around teams, data management, processes, um, risk management, and once again, the concept here is that as you're establishing these things, you're constantly reviewing them, uh, testing them, validating them, and revising them as required throughout that time. Now, this is the really exciting part. Well, I get really excited about this. Um, who needs digital governance, or ultimately, what can actually go, go wrong without digital governance? Um, so I guess it's uh, some airing of uh, dirty laundry, um, which everyone, I, I, said, I know I certainly enjoy hearing these things in these presentations. So truth or myth, um, governance is a lot of people talking, will only, only ever get in the way and slow me down from doing real work. Um, I think you can all guess it's a myth, or I'm going to say it's a myth. Um, heads up who's come across people with this kind of viewpoint around governance or other kind of, um, I guess, planning practices and things like that. Cool. Um, and what, I guess, when you're in that situation and uh, you enthusiastically put your hand up, so we'll, uh, we'll go to you, sir. Um, how, how do you deal with that yourself? What, how, do you, how do you respond to that situation or that, that um, suggestion? Yeah. So really it's about showing um, people who use this what the standards and expectations of the government and that's where you're not just sitting around and talking. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess the myth is along those lines I don't need digital, digital governance. Um, and the concept there is yes. Um, it's not that it, the idea behind it is actually have resilience to handle stresses that will eventually accumulate um, in the absence of effective decision making processes. A bit wordy. Um, but in the end, I guess the, the, when things are going well, things are going well, there's no problems. You can do it your own way and, and there's no issues and there's no hassles. But in the end, um, what I guess I see is digital governance, the benefit around that is building that resilience. Um, so when you do hit situations that aren't expected, there are problems, there are issues. How will that be dealt with? Um, and you know, we can all live in hope and we can all live in optimism. Um, but in the end, um, these things will come up. Um, but I guess along the lines of what you described, if you Kind of, I guess it's viewed as a set of rules and regulations and kind of that authoritative thing that we talked about before. It can, I guess, put people off. One thing I don't really talk about um, directly in this presentation, but it's around, I guess, the subtlety of trying to actually uh, inject digital governance into um, your organization. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're touching on as well, um, which don't address here, but um, keen to have a chat with um, anyone after this presentation about that point as well. Um, so setting the scene, uh, what could possibly go wrong? So this is, I guess, the background as to 
um, a potential project which I may or may not have worked on um, or was, was aware of. Um, uh, and so large multinational company um, consolidating multiple, multiple, multiple websites across multiple regions, multiple languages, multiple everything on a single web platform using the Acquia Site Cloud um, factory um, platform. What's the platform there? So what was the circumstances? A three-month project, uh, internal team with multiple vendors uh, involved in the design, website build, testing, everything, aggressive timelines for go live type, but who, who's worked on a project like this before? Yeah, yeah, they're always fun, aren't they? Um, Define scope versus agile delivery. Um, no, one, uh, no one cares about digital governance thinking or concepts. Let's just make it happen. Um, and at the same time, why not let's do digital transformation of the internal business to achieve even greater things and somehow those efficiencies are going to make everything work great. Uh, so what did go wrong? I think you guys probably guessed all these. Um, pre allocation of funds, time overrun, lots of conflict, um, inability to make decisions, bad focus, and um, deliverables being done that simply made no sense. Um, so one of the ex calling out some of the major issues, and before I f get hypnotized and stuff, we're going to move on from this, but uh, effectively, the work remained uh, perpetually in progress. Um, so one kind of key example of, of the issues that were happening was we had a visual design process um, that was allowed to continue whilst previous sprints remained open with show-stopping issues. Um, the catch cry was, we can't stop to discuss our problems because we have a tight deadline, um, which makes Absolutely no sense. Um, but it was very important to not talk about these things. So no approvals meant no work was ever actually completed. Um, sprints kept going, but problems kept accumulating. Um, project management had no idea what the hell was going on because there was no uh, reflection back as to what was going on or visibility of that. The executive had absolutely no idea what was going on. Um, and then in turn, because of the multiple vendor relationships, the next vendor in line to start on X date simply couldn't be briefed in to actually start their work. So things grinded to an absolute halt. So lessons learned from this, um, when introducing a process, be ready to compromise and face with new challenges, be agile, the dream that is sold, um, but at the same time, regularly evaluate the impact of those compromises. Um, if you are going to compromise in a process, um, you, sh you should factor in stopping to reevaluate that. Um, but the key thing here is if you don't actually stop, um, if you don't actually evaluate these things, this becomes the new normal. So you think about, um, I guess, if all of a sudden it's, also, it's all very, very stressful, um, you've decided to compromise on a particular approach and run with that, if that isn't being, I guess, made visible um, and available to your management, um, your colleagues, et cetera, you've effectively created the new de facto process. So if there's a process defined or one undefined, you've actually created it by doing what you're doing. The problem is you simply have no support from your organization. So you are effectively going alone, and nobody wants that. Another issue, multiple partners with competing approaches. Uh, so once again, multiple vendors involved with this, um, in this project. Um, the concept was uh, the client had brought in the experts, so let's lead them to do what they do best. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Misalignment between expectations of every partner. Everyone had a different view as to what was to be achieved, how it could be done, why it should be done. Uh, who was doing what was part of the problem. Uh, lots of rework, lots of unplanned meetings, and lost efficiency budget burned. So lessons learnt, or things that should have been done. Um, having a clear responsibility of roles and roles, the roles and responsibilities um, between you and your partners. Um, you've got these partners, so why not actually involve those partners in developing your frameworks, critiquing your frameworks? If you've got a wonderful plan in place, don't simply whack them over the head with as, as they walk in the door. Ask them about it. Collaborate with them. Help them to review. Help them to actually help them to help you improve upon, um, upon that based, based on their experience and their, their understanding. Um, and ultimately working together to align um, those competing visions um, to achieve a broader benefit to the overall program and work that you're doing. Um, so the next kind of major area that, to call out was who owns, the scope and, who, who owns the scope and what actually is that scope. So part of the problem, once again, with this wonderful project was um, we're running an agile delivery proce uh, process and uh, you know, ultimately you need a, uh, a prioritized um, backlog of work to be done. Um, you have a product owner. They're meant to be guiding and actually, and actually delivering, helping deliver that vision for the project itself. Uh, the problem was that, this, was that this backlog never actually stayed still. Um, constant reprioritization, uh, depending on which executive sponsor rocked up and had a look at the project at the time. So 
Um, you start to engage, the partners are start, starting to be engaged by the, the project itself, they'd start their work, then all of a sudden, in the name of Agile, things would shift because this particular executive has walked in the door and that priority is now picked up. Who's worked on that project? Anyone? Anyone? Everyone? Who hasn't worked on that project? I think we probably all have. Um, so what was the impact? Um, there was a vision. I mean, that was the good thing. There was a vision for the project, um, but there simply was no consensus in being able to actually deliver upon and translating those priorities um, and uh, what was the most valuable thing we worked on. Usual story, budget, time, burnt, um, as things were changed again and again and again. Um, so one point I keep saying, I think if anyone has ever talked talk to me about talk, talk to me about Agile, um, being only one product owner is an essential thing. Um, by having that product owner jumping to the whims of multiple different uh, stakeholders, there, were, there weren't really one product owner, they'd effectively um, remove their responsibility and pass it back up to multiple managers fighting over that, that responsibility. Um, in the end, I think the problem was the classic one of the product owner wasn't delegated that authority. The reason why they were flipping and flopping back and forth was because they simply didn't have the real authority to actually deliver upon the vision that the organization had set forth. Um, at the same time, uh, a, pro a program roadmap that actually underpins that is a great guideline. For that product owner and their executive, by having that roadmap in place, they can all point at that and they can all look at that. And when someone comes across and says, um, I want to spend my time, I, I think you should, you should really put the, uh, the headshot of the CEO on the front page of the website. Um, you can look at that, that roadmap and you can say, where is it on the roadmap that that's an important thing? Is this purely a vanity project for that, um, for that CEO? Yes, it probably is. Well, hey, let's not do that. That doesn't make any sense. So ultimately, um, where, where did this project get to? Uh, it was a reset with a positive project outcome, which is a nice story to have. Um, in the end, uh, once again, uh, a lot of optimism, a lot of hope, um, but uh, very, very little digital governance. And so in the end, um, what was decided was uh, with a lot of pain uh, and decision making and discussions and multiple meetings again and again and again, uh, the project went on hold. Um, based on the, the, uh, the budget being burnt, the time being wasted, um, we were able to get to a situation where explaining that making even more poor decisions based on a, a timeline which in the end did not need to hold um, wasn't going to be beneficial for anybody, the partners, the client, the budget, the stakeholders, there was no benefit in that process. Um, so at the same time, by putting on hold, um, the outstanding issues around design, scope, delegation, vendor relations could be resolved um, by giving it that space. Um, we went through the process of actually establishing um, that governance framework um, to support um, that decision-making processes, um, as well as bringing all the partners into the room to actually have a conversation instead of that dictatorial kind of approach that was being uh, put in place. You go live established and was met. Um, at the same time, um, civil time being established for that. So what digital governance can do for you? Uh, digital governance is, once again, a decision-making framework uh, which defines the people, the processes, the technologies used to support a digital marketing organization, uh, provide clarity on your roles and responsibilities within your work, and is most needed when organizations are distributed and have competing priorities. Uh, what can do for your organization, strategy and ownership, um, establish roles, responsibilities, clear ownership um, and clear lines of communication, develop uh, a decision-making model so that goals can be prioritized and communicated across the, the enterprise itself, improve corporate culture, et cetera, et cetera, um, define those policies and stand standards. Um, all these things I'm talking about here, hands up who thinks their organization has actually got this down pat. Partway there? Yeah, um, and I guess the thing is that um, do find that um, digital governance is, and I think I was having a brief conversation with uh, uh, some from a, uh, a water authority based out of Melbourne, um, that these are things that people talk about a lot, but don't, don't necessarily deliver upon well. Um, one of the things is that I find that um, executive are less interested and engaged with working with um, digital governance. Once again, that viewpoint around and that myth around uh, it being a lot of talking with little value. Um, at the same time, the issues around um, actually selling digital governance within organizations itself uh, is one of the hardest possible things. Um, because you have, and I guess probably every single person sitting in this room has likely an interest in digital governance, has experience with and also experienced poor outcomes within projects itself. 
Um, and I guess the thing is that we can talk a lot about digital governance, but without actually having that, uh, I guess, implemented and working throughout your organization, um, there's less benefit of that. And so I guess the, I don't necessarily cover it in this presentation, but once again, um, how to actually get digital governance thinking um, introduced within organizations is a big struggle, um, as it is. Uh, and I guess the other thing here is that um, I keen to, I'm keen to actually um, ask I guess you guys in the audience as to um, what has been a strategy that's worked well within your organizations um, that has actually delivered upon um, digital governance or at least partway through that approach. So hands up who has, I guess, talked about these things within their organization, met some hesitation, but has been able to actually overcome that um, within your organization. And I guess if no one puts their hands up, it means that no one has actually ever succeeded in getting anything through in this place. Jeremy, what have you got? What have you hit? challenges are different, so I suppose we try and uh, spend a lot of time educating our clients in these sort of things, um, which is often difficult, and especially as you're changing uh, quite regularly, so you sometimes you yeah, put all this effort in and then you have to do that all over again. Um, <clears throat> but our, our producers and project managers are very comfortable by doing this so often that it's becoming kind of second nature. So our first step is ingraining the... So do you find yourself educating clients as to how to work through these types of things? Is that kind of yeah. what the activity is? Yeah, because often it's all new to them. They, they have no idea. So um, yeah. seeing as we've done it so regularly, it's uh, a lot more comfortable for us to get them into this mindset and that makes our life much easier going forward because you're avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that you mentioned. Yeah, and so do you find, I mean, is Agile helped in that respect or is it kind of made things harder or? Yeah, Agile's great, um, but it's um, often very difficult to get that as a commitment up front. So mm. our approach is we work Agile, but it's often with a waterfall budget. So Obviously, everyone would love to work agile with, um, yeah. All the money in the world. All the money in the world, but approval needs to be uh, gotten for buckets of money. So, mm. but that's, again, with doing this so many times, it's become quite easy to deal with just uh, putting the power in their hands with restrictions. And so I guess the thing I was alluding to there around Agile is that um, we do find a lot of projects start that haven't actually had the planning in place in front of them. It's kind of the, I guess the extreme opposite of um, Waterfall where people will spend you know, years and years and years potentially briefing a project, which in the end, by the time it starts, of course, the requirements are so out of date, um, irrelevant as it is. But the other extreme is no thought around actually having frameworks um, to actually support a project going forward actually gets done. Um, and so I guess the experience that we have is that um, that education of clients, um, when we come on, on board, a lot of that, I guess the first couple of weeks is actually trying to establish these things, test and validate, have these, have these types of governance things been established. Um, and I guess the thing that we're always looking for is, you know, I can go through um, these slides as to, I guess, what the benefits are, but trying to find that hook within an organization itself um, to actually get that motivation, that interest, and actually enact that change is, I guess, part of the goals um, of my role at the start of a project as it is. Um, and so trying to find those angles, and I guess part of the reason for us in the audience is trying to take some extra notes down myself um, as, as to how that has been achieved. And I guess um, from a client side perspective, I guess um, more internal team perspective, hands up who is on more, usually on the client side working with outside vendors? Cool. Um, I mean, the flip side of that situation, I mean, hands up who I guess have had vendors come in the door um, to actually try and start a process. Have you had governance models in places? Has it worked well with having a vendor coming in to actually help establish those, those practices within your organization? Um, how do you find that situation? I guess, I had some hands up here. If uh, don't get a volunteer, I'm gonna pick someone out uh, who looks friendly and smiley. Um, there's a friendly, smiley person right there. Uh, it usually comes into play with us with, of course, the bigger clients again, which comes down to, um, again, the amount of money in the pot that we can 
afford to spend in like I don't know, part of the project management for us mm. to, to sort of set all these processes up. So a lot of our smaller clients, as if we're Hobart based, yep. a lot of our client portfolio is, is the smaller um, client. And while we, we try and set up a lot of these parameters on a, a project level, um, again, depending on the size of the project of revisiting um, over and over again throughout the process, um, mm. sometimes just doesn't happen just because we're trying to get the job done. Um, we've got a, just a finite amount of hours. I know that goes against the agile uh, concept, but yeah. um, uh, a, lo a lot of our clients here are working to a, a finite budget. Yeah. Um, so while we try and, and lay out all these parameters and work out who's doing what, again, like everything that you've stated previously, um, yeah, we, we only really fulfil any of this with the larger whether it's a, a government department or, or mm. larger private clients. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess part of that is um, what we try and put forward. And we kind of moved to Q&A. So I guess uh, if you have, any, have you got any questions, feel free to put your hands up and uh, go from there. But on that, that point, I guess the um, having, uh, actually having checkpoints in place predefined um, for a project even before you start, I, I find is being really essential. Because when things are going well, you know, everyone's happy just to not really worry about these things. Um, but at the same time, it's quite easy to delude yourself into thinking that everything is going well until a week before launch, and then, oh my gosh, what's happened? Everything's falling to pieces. Um, so actually establishing those kind of checkpoints throughout the project itself to kind of reassess those plans. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. Yeah, if you can't, if you can't actually even find your product owner because they're on 3,000 other different things at once, um, to actually sit down and even talk to you, because they are, they are a three-person band, and yeah, it's, it's quite difficult, so. Yeah, like, a, a lot of these seminars have been great, just listening to, to the, the great talks like some of yourself is giving, but um, again, being such a small business, um, we have a lot of hats to wear in our organisation, and so where a lot of the large businesses uh, that have been giving these seminars have individual operators within the company that can yeah. focus on these areas, um, sometimes we're, we're running around doing so many different things that, again, um, things get left a little bit sometimes in a project where we're, we're trying to cover off on other areas of the project. So, mm, mm. But, um, yeah. Have you solved that problem yet? Uh, on, a, on, a pro yeah, on, a, <laughs> on a constantly weekly basis, yeah, we're trying yeah. to. Yeah. So, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll start posing questions back to the audience. Jeremy, you had a question? Actually, actually, sorry, Jeremy's spoken enough. Uh, sorry, you had a question. A question down the back there. Have fun running around. I think. So, question down this way, or is that more of just a scratch of the face? We can. We go back to Jeremy as it is. Okay, no worries. Sorry, Fonda. No, oh, come on, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I just thought of maybe this is more advice rather than a question and answer. Is something that we're going through at the moment is we're putting together. Uh, full project methodology, so um, from uh, pitch through to proposal through to every step and we also have sort of managed services so it's sort of even offboarding that project into business BAU. as usual. Yep. Um, and as part of that we've kind of just did some really deep brainstorming sessions to try and come up with everything we're possibly going to need to address and we've kind of made our own uh, handbook on this is how you deal with a project. So in sort of your case, you're wearing many hats um, and sort of have to think about sort of lots of things. If you constantly be able to uh, maybe once a week look in this booklet and go, we're at this phase of the project or right, this week I should be sort of talking about sort of these things and sort of it kind have of you removes. Have you had a chance to test that out? I mean, you mentioned, is that that's a recent thing as such, that methodology and approach? Yeah, we've kind of just done a few chapters so far. Okay. So kind of really the start and the end. So we're yeah. currently working our way through the middle. But it's been really successful with um, making sure all of our projects start off consistently these days. And we've mm. got all of our requirements. And we don't get halfway through and you're going, oh, we're, we're kind of missing this important thing, which if we just asked the question at the start, we would have had that. So. And I guess my, my natural aversion is uh, to methodology, not necessarily to methodologies, but I guess the, the, the volume actually is, and I guess it's time spent against that because 
guess thinking agile from a methodology perspective that these things need to evolve as well. And I guess the fact that it's a newer thing, I'd be keen to ask you, I guess, in six months' time as to how that actually is progressing and how much change has actually been put back into that as it is. Yeah. Um, because I think the part of the old kind of project management concept, PMO concept, was define the process, that's the process, do the process, do that, and everything will be perfect. Um, and the reality is, uh, when you hit the ground running, um, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Yeah. We talked about the compromises that you need to make, um, at the same time be able to communicate those back up. So I guess it's me being able to have that uh, methodology, but also keeping that conversation open to critique as such. So, and you guys are great, so I'm sure you keep doing that as well. So Yeah, you're never going to solve all the problems. Um, no. And I guess the key is just to make sure that you're not missing stuff, which, and especially when you're sort of onboarding new staff, project managers, you're able to put them, you know, this is how we do things and they're starting off in the right place with a really good knowledge of how to deal with projects. Um, so yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Chris. Um, my question is just uh, briefly about um, governance um, with sort of, uh, I suppose, when you're, do you ever see a situation where you should compromise on governance in any way? So uh, I've worked in uh, teams where often you're understaffed and so forth and often governance is switching very, very quickly. It's almost like once you're set in one team, you're, you're about to deliver on a project and then it's a new uh, manager and so forth with a whole new set of goals and objectives and so forth and often it feels that I kind of feel that if you want to um, ship a project before moving on to a, a new set of goals I suppose uh, you kind of have to compromise on some of the particulars when it comes to a strategy or something like this so mm. um, do you have any experience there in terms of uh, when to compromise and uh, and when to go back to the plan? Well, I guess it's, it's compromise for the right reasons is, is the usual thing. It's, it's have that, um, actually have that conversation um, about why you are compromising and what the benefit actually is. Um, I mean, I talked a little bit earlier about the whole de facto process being established if you don't even talk about it. Like, you can't escape that reality. It's just you're not actually talking about it. Um, so in the end, um, in the end uh, yes, that compromise um, can make sense, but do it in a visible fashion, do it in a way that, um, do it in a way that actually does, um, I guess, start it, test it, and make sure it works, um, is the key thing around that, so. Hopefully that helps. Do it for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Um, and have you had an experience of that, I suppose, working um, well? Um, I guess uh, I, uh, I have my own natural aversion to, um, uh, I said methodologies are stuck in stone. Um, and I guess the, probably the best examples are that um, I, I may or may not actually um, adhere to all parts of um, our own methodologies within our projects, but when I do that, um, I've got to have a really, really good reason um, to be doing that. Um, ideally communicating that reason, um, but also being responsible for making that decision. So I guess in the end, you are, if, if you think that you have a better way of doing something, you're taking on that responsibility yourself. So you've got to know you're doing it right. You've got to make sure you, uh, I guess if you're going to fail with that, fail very quickly so you can revert back. Um, but you're ultimately taking responsibility for that action itself. Um, if you can't convince, of course, your superiors and things like that. So I guess that's the, the dangerous part of it. Um, but at the same time, you are closest to the ground. So you're likely going to be able to experience, um, you have that experience, you have that knowledge, and you can make that decision po possibly more, I guess, more accurately than someone else a little bit further up. So yeah, um, yes, a little bit dangerous though, a little bit dangerous. So, and I think we're actually at time. So thank you very much. Thank you.